Try this, my son. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Animation. The act, process, or result of animating. The condition or quality of being animate. Liveliness, spirit, vitality. The art and process of preparing animated cartoons. An animated cartoon. Nobody knows what magician first created the illusion of motion using a flipbook. It's a simple idea. Draw a series of pictures, slightly changing each succeeding picture. Put them all in a stack, flip through the pile fast enough, and voila! Your picture has motion. The challenge is to make the object appear to move smoothly and realistically. Contemporary animators owe a debt to a visionary 19th century photographer named Edward Maybridge, who made a detailed study of the way people and animals move. Although the study predated the invention of moving pictures, his photographs illustrate movement so clearly that when run in series, they create the illusion of motion. Classical animation methods haven't changed much since then. Artists draw each picture by hand. The pictures, called cells, were recorded one frame at a time onto film. And as the film industry developed, so did animation. First talkies, and then color gave artists unprecedented freedom to indulge their imagination. And the audiences loved it. Animators, looking for another breakthrough, began using computers to create three-dimensional images. Images that looked real. Armed with this new technology, their animations could create both lifelike situations and wild fantasies. Like these animations from The Mind's Eye, a computer animation odyssey video. Unfortunately, the computers that had enough power to create such complex detailed images were quite large and very expensive. Something's happening to drink boxes. In the last 10 years, computers have become more powerful, more compact, and more economical. As a result, computers are now being used throughout the animation industry. Paint programs are replacing the classical animator's paper and ink. Computer-generated 3D graphics are dressing up film and video productions. And video images are being used as elements within animations. Because of advances in technology, personal computers have replaced the supercomputers of the 1960s, bringing animation to the desktop. And of all the PCs available, the Amiga offers the fewest impediments to realizing your creative vision. From its inception, animation has been a critical component of the Amiga, and it remains the only personal computer whose operating system includes a powerful collection of animation routines. One of the most impressive demonstrations of the machine at its 1985 launch was RoboCity, a simple but effective display that used the Amiga's built-in animation routines. And the Boing Ball so captivated the imagination, it became the de facto logo for the Amiga computer. For years, the Boing Ball was emulated by other computer systems to show that they too could be used for animation. Aegis Animator was one of the first commercial software packages of any kind available for the Amiga. This program automated the classical two-dimensional animation technique called tweening. First, the animator draws starting and ending cells of emotion. In a classical studio, lesser artists called tweeners would draw the cells in between, dividing the change equally among them. This shape-changing process is called morphing. With Aegis Animator, the computer automatically creates the intervening cells. Once finished, the animation can be played back in real time, and viewable copies can be distributed even to those who don't own the software.
Soon after, a revolutionary animation appeared. Dr. Eric Graham's The Juggler. Its geometric world and mirrored spheres introduced three-dimensional ray-traced animation to the Amiga. It became much like the Boing Ball before it, a symbol of the computer and its dominance in the animation field. By this time, Amiga animation was in full swing. Animation standards had been established, letting artists use several different programs to get just the right effect in their work. And software like D-Paint 3 combined 2D animation and paint programs to give artists a single package with more creative power than they ever had before. In animation, more than any other application, choosing the right software package is absolutely vital to your success. Often, you can get similar results from a number of programs, but you'll find major differences in their user interface. And no matter how powerful the software is, if you can't learn to use it, the power it contains is out of your reach. To help find out what software is right for you, let's look at what's available in both two- and three-dimensional animation. Two-dimensional animation software is the most common and is conceptually very similar to drawing on paper. And in many ways, it's the same method used by classical animators. You draw a series of cells or frames, with each showing some degree of change. When the cells are cycled rapidly, the eye perceives movement. Two major animation packages that take this approach are the Disney Animation Studio from Walt Disney Computer Software and Deluxe Paint 4 from Electronic Arts. The Animation Studio is based upon the same techniques used by Disney's classical animators. The package is divided into two sections, the Pencil Test and Ink and Paint. These names illustrate the approach that Disney takes to animation. First, Disney animators rough out their projects without using color, as in the pencil test. Then, when they have the frames drawn and ordered as they want them, the animators move to ink and paint to add color and make finishing touches. Using the pencil test, you create black and white sketches of the animation, working out the images, storyline, and timing of the project. You will use it to draw the frames, set the series to music, and clean up the sketches before adding color. The Animation Studio was the first program to feature the onion skin technique. This feature makes the frames appear translucent, letting you see several frames at once. It's much easier to make changes in your current frame when you can see the previous frame. Once you get the hang of it, the onion skin technique and Disney's wide variety of drawing tools will help you make accurate changes faster and you'll have smoother, more professional animations. Now the real fun begins coloring your animation with ink and paint. Like the pencil test, you have a set of specialized tools. The most obvious addition is, of course, the color palette. Tools and colors are selected with your mouse and pointer. First, select the area fill tool, shaped like a paint can. Then select the color. Then click on a section of your drawing. When you're finished coloring your animation, you can further customize it by adding a background scene. Deluxe Paint 4 is the latest in a popular series of programs that combines graphics and 2D animation. With its wide assortment of drawing, painting, and animation tools, D-Paint 4 is easily the most useful Amiga graphics program available. As in Disney software, in D-Paint 4 you animate using the classical cell method. Draw a series of images, modifying each one, then cycle through them quickly to create the illusion of movement. You draw and color your images using a variety of tools controlled by the mouse. And you can use D-Paint's light table feature to view three frames simultaneously, the same way you can with the onion skin feature in Disney's Animation Studio. 
But the differences between the programs are as significant as their similarities. One unique D-Paint tool is the Anim brush. Most Amiga users are familiar with the brush concept. You outline an area of the screen, pick it up, save it, and use it later as clip art. The same logic applies to animated brushes. Take an animation, select an area of the cell, and pick it up. Only this time, the program cuts the section out of each cell in the animation, as if you were pushing a cookie cutter through the entire stack of cells. What you get is called an anim brush, a miniature version of your animation that can be pasted into other screens and animations. Then you can animate your brushes further by using some of D-Paint 4's more sophisticated features. For instance, if you want your brush to move across the screen while flipping and rotating, the Move Requester will do it for you. If instead you want one image to turn into another image, simply make brushes out of the starting and ending images. Then select Brush Morphing, and the computer will turn them into an anim brush that transforms from the first image into the second. Previous versions of Deluxe Paint supported the various Amiga screen resolutions, but they could only display 64 colors at once. Deluxe Paint 4, on the other hand, supports the hold and modify display mode, which can show over 4,000 colors on the screen simultaneously. With the broader color palette, you can create pictures and animations that look more lifelike with minute color variations of shadow and light. One of the most powerful 3D packages available to Amiga users is Imagine from Impulse. It's a full-featured animation and rendering program that supports 24-bit graphics and both Amiga display modes. Imagine divides the animation process into several stages, including detail, forms, cycle, stage, action, and project, each available from a pop-down menu. An additional menu gives you options to customize the program, selecting new screen colors and defining hotkeys. You typically begin by creating objects in the Detail Editor. This section lets you create easily modeled objects, such as spheres and boxes. When the shape is defined, you assign its surface characteristics, like the color, the material it's made from, what patterns cover the surface, and how reflective it is. To create objects with more detailed organic shapes, such as a face, you would use the Forms Editor, which gives you fine control over the object. The object must then be loaded into the Detail Editor to have its surface attributes defined before it can be rendered or displayed. Once your object is created, it's given motion in the Cycle Editor. There you can define its movement and attach it to other objects. The Cycle Editor is very powerful and lets you set up complex movement combinations among the various objects in your animation. To actually place the object within the scene, you need to load it into the Stage Editor. Within the Stage Editor, you place the objects, set the lights, and set the camera in a series of key cells. Define key cells for the start and end of each movement, and Imagine will create the frames that come between them. For fine-tuning, load up the Action Editor. With it, you can refine the elements of your animation and add special effects like Explode, Grow, and Crumble. By this time, your animation should be about done. From the Project Editor, select the Display Mode and the Frame Resolution and start rendering. Like most 3D programs, Imagine has a steep learning curve. New users should be prepared to spend a fair amount of time learning both the program itself and the fundamentals of 3D modeling and animation. However, because of its price, speed, features, and overall power, Imagine is the single most popular 3D animation package for the Amiga. In late 1990, Newtek released its now famous Video Toaster multifunction video card for the Amiga. Along with all the video effects and other features of the toaster was an animation package called Lightwave 3D. Lightwave is a professional quality animation package, including features that were previously found only on systems costing many times more. And in spite of its immense power, Lightwave has one of the friendliest user interfaces available. Creating three-dimensional animations using Lightwave is a lot like making a movie. You build scenes that contain objects. You choose the number, kind, and location of the lights. Then you decide where the camera is and what path it will follow through the animation. Almost anything can be an object in a three-dimensional scene. 
apples, dinosaurs, text logos, or even spaceships can be loaded into the 3D animation program and brought to life as an animated object. The object is actually a computer data file that mathematically describes the shape. A variety of objects come with the LightWave software, and more are available through commercial libraries of 3D objects. If you want to create your own, you can use a 3D modeling program such as LightWave Modeler, which comes with a LightWave animation package. Hi, I'm Joel Hagen. I've been using Deluxe Paint through all of its incarnations. I'm going to be using Deluxe Paint 4 here to show you how to do the animated star field and the tumbling asteroid. The star field makes use of Deluxe Paint's cycle mode, and the tumbling asteroid is a great introduction to one of its, mo one of its most powerful features, the move requester. Let's begin by creating the animated star field. I've set up my palette with all 16 of the displayable gray levels in here that we'll use for the colors of the stars. And I've also built a palette that includes the browns we'll use later in the asteroid effect. It's important to set up ranges at first that encompass these colors. Range 1 incorporates all 16 of the gray levels, and range 2 has all 8 of the browns that I built into the asteroid palette. The cycle mode is the trick we're going to use to create the animated stars. To demonstrate what it does, let me use the straight line tool with just a solid color here in the color mode. As you can see, that, that uh, as, as we paint a line with that color, we get what we'd expect, just a straight solid color line. If we go to the cycle mode, that same line is drawn in all 16 gray levels automatically. Now let's go one step further and click with the right mouse button on the line tool to bring up the spacing requester. We're going to select N total and set that number to be 16, which is the number of values of gray in the range we're using. Now as I draw that line, I get 16 copies of the brush placed in a straight line, each one being drawn in a sequential color in the range of grays that we're using. Let's clear the screen to the black of the sky color, stay in the cycle mode, the straight line tool, and set up a number of animation frames. I'm going to use 25 frames. I'm hitting the F10 key now to turn off the toolbox, going out to about the middle of the screen and holding down the anim painting key. Now I hit the left mouse button and drag a line out to the edge of the screen. And there you see our first star animate across 16 frames of our anim from the center toward the edge. Now I'll just keep moving down, repeating that, starting right from where the first, the first star ends up hold down the anim painting key and stretch the line out. And you can add as many stars to your star field as you want this way. I'm going to keep going here for a little while and build up a fairly dense star field so we have some real action happening. And then we'll look at the results. All right, let's lay in one or two last stars here. Now let's turn the toolbar back on with the F10 key and see what we've done. We'll go down and play it. And there we see that nice high speed zoom effect as we crash through the star field. I'm going to turn that off by hitting the space bar, and let's save that out. I'll call that 1-stars. We'll save it out and bring that back up later on after we've created the tumbling asteroid. All right, let's clear the screen now to a color that we can work against. I'm going to delete all the frames of that animation to 
For the moment, all we need is just a painting screen. I'm going to go back and restore my tools to the default continuous setting here and begin by painting what will be sort of like a map of the asteroid. To start off with, I'm going to set preferences to B square. This lets a square be a square and a circle be a circle. I'm going to go back to the color mode to paint with. And let's choose the browns, maybe go into the fill requester. And just to save a little time, enter that second range of colors, turn random on. And let's just use one of these, this vertical contour fill here. I'm going to draw a filled rectangle, holding down the shift key to constrain that to a square. Picking that up as a brush, I'm going to go to the brush menu, size, and double it horizontally to give myself a wide rectangle. It's exactly twice the dimensions of the square place that on the screen with the left mouse button. And now I want to begin painting the details of the surface of this asteroid, craters and so on in here. I want to lock the background color out using the stencil feature. By just clicking on this background turquoise color, blue color, I can prevent any of my actions, any of my painting actions from affecting that color and restrict them only to to uh, affecting the browns that I'm using here. Let's start with a medium sized brush and the smear mode and just break this up a little bit. We just want to give it a slightly irregular look that we can begin working with a little bit to create the look of the asteroid surface. I'm going to use the airbrush mode and continue doing that same effect. The airbrush in the smear mode. Just to break this all up a little bit. This will give us a nice sort of even looking surface to begin with that because of the gradient fill has already the appearance of light falling on it from above. And we'll hold that right through the animation that we do. Now I'm going to switch to the shade mode and just continue in the same vein. In the shade mode, painting with one button darkens all the colors in the range that it passes over, as I'm doing up here, while the other button lightens the colors, as you see down here. Clicking the right mouse button in the airbrush tool, I can reduce the size of the spatter and actually use it more like a drawing tool. I'm still in the shade mode. At this point, I can get rid of the stencil. I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to free it to save memory. And begin using the shade mode with the airbrush to paint in some crater features. Various sizes. I'm going to go to the dotted line tool now and just a brush slightly larger than a single pixel. Still in the shade mode, begin touching up these shapes a little bit. Add some rays out from the craters. Just begin putting in some details to make this shape a little more interesting, a little more convincing.
adding some highlights. little touches that begin building the illusion of light falling on texture and detail. Put in a few little tiny craters here. And that should give us enough to work with to build the illusion of a, of a spinning asteroid. Now, there's one final step we need to do here. We need to make sure that we have a seamless match on this map between the right, le the right edge and the left edge. Because eventually, we're going to have this map wrap completely around itself with the right edge joining the left edge. So to make sure it does that, we can use a brush and cut a slice from one edge with the right mouse button, removing it cleanly. Now we know these two edges are going to match perfectly. So if we bring this over here and carefully place it at the left edge. Now I've been very lucky here. This looks already like a seamless match. If you aren't so lucky, you can choose a brush and go back in with the smear mode or your shade tools and just soften this up a little bit. Let me go into the smear mode and just do a little bit of touch up where this line joined. If you're a little careful, you won't have much to do at this point. Now I know that this is going to match seamlessly edge to edge. There's one more step we need to do here, and that's to measure the width of this rectangle. One way to do that is to go into preferences and turn the coordinates on temporarily. And now with a single pixel brush, Going back to my straight line tool and making sure I'm back on the continuous default mode here, I can draw a straight line from one end to the other. I'm going to turn the crosshairs off for a moment so that I can see what I do. The delete key toggles the crosshairs on and off. And I'm stretching a line exactly the width of the rectangle and reading that value from the coordinates at the top, 180. I'll just hit undo to undo that. And now I want to bring up the move requester while I can still remember that number. The move requester is sort of a built-in animation package of its own right within the program. I want to enter that number 180 as an X distance in the move requester. This just means that I'm going to be moving this brush 180 pixels or its own width. For now, I'm going to exit, and it will remember that number. Now I need to pick this up as a brush, clear the screen, and set a number of frames. We'll set 25 frames again to equal the number of frames that we set up for our star field. Stamp the brush down once with the left mouse button on the first frame, and undo. Now the computer knows where that brush was, and we don't need to look at it anymore. Bringing the move requester up again, we already have our distance entered here, and we can preview what it's going to do. It should move that map cleanly across the screen to the right, 180 pixels. When we're satisfied that it's doing that properly, we can draw. And that'll complete the first phase of what we need to do. We need this map to have a second copy of itself follow the first across the screen. Go up to Brush Handle and set it to Corner 
so that you can move this map right over and place it next to itself precisely. And now you see why we needed that to be a seamless match. I'm hitting undo again and going back to the move requester. A quick preview to verify that it's following itself. And let's draw that. Now the entire landscape of this asteroid is streaming past the frame. If I hit the number four key, we can see what it's doing. Play it as a looping animation. I'm going to stop that. And let's do an anim brush pickup now. This is just like cutting a brush, but it's going to cut a brush from all the frames of the animation. It's important here to be very precise about positioning that brush exactly over the map itself without the crosshairs going out into the background at all. And you notice I'm cutting out just about exactly a square, one half. of the map that we cut. Now as I paint this around the screen, we can verify that that map is streaming by underneath the anim brush. Let's clear all the frames. Now we need to place this map onto a spinning asteroid. Let's go back with the right mouse button to the fill tool and go back to a solid fill. And I'm just going to choose a color that I can see clearly. And the filled freehand line tool. Now I'm just drawing a rough irregular shape to represent that asteroid. I'm going to pick this up as a brush. Place it down in the screen and undo. Once again, let's go back to the move requester clear all of our previous settings. And this time we just want to spin that. So I'm entering 360 degrees on the z-axis. Previewing that, we'll see that it just spins like looking down on top of a phonograph record. Let's draw that. And this is going to add to the illusion of a tumbling object in space now, as we have this basic shape spinning in one direction while the map flows by in another. We can take a look at that by hitting the 4 key to play this. And there you see the tumbling effect as it spins. Now let's fill it so that we have something that looks like an asteroid. So I'm going to go to Anim Brush Use so that we know we're using our Anim Brush. Right mouse button in the Fill tool and this time we're going to use the Wrap. And this gives the illusion of wrapping whatever brush you use, including an anim brush, onto a three-dimensional surface. Holding down the anim painting key now, I'm clicking the left mouse button to begin using the anim brush to fill this shape. And it automatically goes through each frame of the animation, advancing the anim brush one cell at a time to fill this shape. So now we're combining two separate movements the spinning rotation with the anim brush sweeping by horizontally. Let's play that now with a four key. And there we get the effect of a tumbling asteroid in space. You can adjust the speed with the left and right arrow keys on the keyboard. Once we're satisfied with that, let's in turn pick this up as an anim brush using anim brush pickup. Making sure that I make a brush big enough to get around the entire tumbling surface. And we'll place this into our star field animation. 
So I'm reloading the stars that we made. And both of these animations share the same palette. And there are a number of ways that we could place this into the animation. Let's use the move requester to do it. So going back to move, we'll clear all the settings again. Make sure that we place this anim brush down in the middle here. Undo. And now we're not going to enter any movement settings at all. We just want that animation to be laid down right in the same place. We'll preview it just as a precaution and then draw it. Now each frame of the anim brush pops right into the middle of the screen as though we're following this hurtling asteroid through space. Let's hit the four key and see what it looks like. So there we have it. Pretty quick technique that gives you a, a nice visual reward without much work. Hi, I'm Lou Wallace, Senior Editor at Amiga World Magazine. I'm going to demonstrate LightWave 3D which is a 3D modeling and animation package that's included with the Video Toaster software. We're going to be looking at release 2.0 of the Video Toaster package, which has all the latest features and functions of LightWave. For the demonstration, I'm going to create a chessboard and revolve a camera around the chessboard and the chessman. To do so, I'm using a, a library of pre-existing objects, the chessboard and the chessman and I'm not going to create them within the existing modeler package. Now I could do this, or if I was talented enough, and obviously uh, you could do it if you're talented enough, but to, for the sake of brevity for this demonstration, I'm going to use existing models. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do, this is essentially a walkthrough, um, a guided tour perhaps of LightWave, but it's going to be a quick one. We don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to try and explain as much as I can, but there are going to be some things that I just don't have time to explain, or I'm going to assume that you already know. If you get a little confused, I suggest you go back and watch the demo again. And if you have access to LightWave, perhaps walk through the demonstration, reproducing some of the things that I do, uh, and I think it'll become a lot more clear. So let's get started and create an animation. So the first thing we need to do is load up some objects. Now, going to the object menu and selecting load object, it gives me a list of all the various directories in the object directory, and I'm going to choose the chess uh, directory. The first thing I want is the chess board. Now, these are from the Amiga World library, so they've been converted from Turbo Silver objects over to Sculpt, and then LightWave will load Sculpt images and objects. We've got the chessboard. Now, one by one, I'm going to load all the various pieces. And this is the black bishop. You notice the points in the polygon number increases with every object that I, that I load. Depending on the amount of memory you have, you can only load you know, so many objects. But we have plenty of, of storage or current capacity left, so we can get everything in we need. Let's get the black king. black knight, and the white queen. Now we've now loaded the entire set of, of um, chessmen that we're going to use as well as the chess board. The first thing we need to do is to go to the layout menu and start positioning these. Now I'm going to zoom in a lot because I want to have a lot of detail and I'm going to change my grid size which is the fold is 1000 down to 100. Zoom back out a bit. OK. Now, the first thing I need to, do, need to do is go to the Object Edit option. And when I select Object, whatever is in here, whatever item is selected here, in this case, it's the chessboard, will be highlighted. See how it's a brighter white uh, rectangle? Now, that we want to make everything level with the top of this. So I'm going to cycle through these. First, I'm selecting the black bishop. And I want to constrain the movement to along just the Y axis. I don't want to move along the X and Z yet. So I've turned those off, and I'm only moving on the Y axis. So by holding down the mouse button, I'm able to very carefully move it. And notice how I lined up 
the black bishop right along with the top of the chessboard. Now let's do the next one, the black castle. We'll move that down. Now we're not, we haven't started the horizontal positioning yet, but we gotta get everything lined up for the top. There, now we're back to the chessboard. What I wanna do now is I wanna create a keyframe and I wanna lock all of these into position so they won't move off their Y axis. So I, I select create key and I wanna do all items. So I click on OK. Now everything is locked in here. I'm gonna go back to the top down view and zoom out a bit so I can see all of my chessboard and center it here on the screen. Okay, and fill it up just a little. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to move these objects into the various squares that I want them to be on the chessboard. Uh, to do that, I only need to move them in the X and Y axis, not in the Y, because we've already set that. So I'm going to turn on X and Y, and I don't want to move the chessboard, I want to move the object. So I'm going to go to the first object, which is the bishop. Now I'm going to move that over to one of these squares. Now since I can't see them right now, if I wait a little while, they'll all become visible, but the moment I move anything, it goes back to the simple rectangles, which makes things uh, work a little smoother. Uh, I'm going to move it to an approximation of where I think that square is and then release it. Then, if I wait a few seconds and take my hand off the mouse and the mouse button, the computer will calculate all the new positions and all the vectors here, and it'll show me all the lines of the objects. And we'll be able then to define, see how closely I am to the square. And that should be coming up here in just a second. There it is. So you see I'm off a little bit. I need to move it over just a little, so I'm gonna grab it again and move it over just a little more. I think that's about right. So I'm going to go to the next one, which is a castle. And I'll move the castle up to about here. OK. Now I've got everything more or less positioned the way I want them. So the next thing I need to do is I need to lock everything in place, because I've got all these objects positioned here, more or less in the center of the, of the squares that I want them. I've got them lined up along the top of the chessboard. So everything's fine. I want to make sure they don't move. So again, I'm going to go back to Create Key. And only this time we'll say select all items and uh, click on OK. Now all of these are locked into place. They're all positioned here and they're not going to move. The next thing I need to do is set my camera. So let's go to camera view and let's choose camera. Now we can move the camera in and out by simply, let's, let's just work on the z-axis, which is into the, to, to the depth of uh, the dimension of the mon monitor. And by moving the mouse, I can move the camera back and forward, f closer or further away from the objects. Let's put it right about here and, and raise it up just a little bit. Now I want to rotate it down, so it's going to look down at the chessboard and perhaps move it in a bit more. Okay. Let's lock the camera in place. Let's create a key just for that camera. Selected item. Now, I want to rotate the camera around this, looking down at the chessboard. I could go around and I could move the, the, the camera to different positions and create different keys for it, but there's an easier way of doing it. So let's exit the layout and go back to the object menu, and let's load another object. This time, let's load something called a null object. A null object is an object supplied with light wave. It's a single point. It doesn't really have any shape. It's just a point, a mathematical point. But we can do some interesting things but with the use of a null object. Now we've got it loaded. Notice it's just one point. We go to the layout menu and just look straight down and zoom in just a bit. Okay? And I want to go back to object and I want to choose the null object. So we've got null object chosen. If you look carefully right here, the very center of the screen, you can see a little white dot. That's just the, the position of the null object. It's not anything that's really visible once we animate, but it's there. And you see here it is, right at the, uh, at the center of the board. Now what I want to do, going back to camera view here, what I want to do is I want to lock the camera to this null object so that the parent for the, for the camera will be, let's go to the camera, the parent will be the null object. Okay, the, so now the, the, the camera is locked to the null object. Whatever we do to the null object, well, the camera will respond to. So let's go to frame 180. Okay, what I want to do is I want to 
go to the null object, and I want to rotate that so that by the time it get, we get the frame 180, I want it to have rotated 360 degrees on its axis. So I'm entering 360. So as you can see, in frame 180, the null object will have rotated 360 degrees. Let's create a key for that object. Now let's go back to frame 0. Now, now we've got 180 frames here, which means that the null object is going to rotate 2 degrees per frame. Let's go back to the layout menu, to the scene menu, and let's say the last frame will be 180. Okay. Go back to the layout menu. And let's create a preview of this. I want to go make preview, and I want to do it with a bounding box. Bounding boxes are these square rectangles, where, which are drawn a lot quicker than actually rendering the wireframe of the objects. So we're going to do a preview of the animation using bounding boxes. Now notice, you see it's drawing. Look at the frame change over here. And it's drawing each one of these, so we're seeing the position. And what we're seeing here is what the camera is doing. The little null object in the center of the, of the display is rotating. The camera is locked to that, so the camera is rotating with the null object. Now we're ready to render. Let's go ahead and render just one frame so we can take a look at the scene and see what it looks like. So I'll set it up on manual, and I'll click Go. As Lightwave renders on your Amiga screen, you will see a grayscale representation of the image that's being rendered. This is not the true image, it's merely a representation. And depending on the complexity of the scene, it'll take a while to render. Now, as we can see, this looks pretty good. The image is fine. Obviously, we're in low resolution mode, but otherwise, it looks pretty good. So now, let's go back to the Video Toaster uh, Lightwave screen. And while we're all set to go, let's uh, set it up for record mode. We turn on record. Since we're going to be using the Nucleus single frame controller, the record command is T pound sign. That's already there, and we're ready to go. Uh, just quickly checking over everything. We've got 180 frames. We've got all of our objects, surfaces, the images, the lights, the camera. Everything's fine. We're in low resolution. Backdrop is fine. Set up for black. Record is on. Now all we got to do is just say render. This time we switch it to automatic, and then we when we click on OK, it will begin the job of rendering each frame frame of the 180 frames, dumping each frame to tape. And then tomorrow, when we run it again, we'll have uh, a six-second animation. So here we go. Now, as you can see, that looks really very nice. While it was done in low resolution, uh, the motion smooths everything out. You've got a nice six-second loop. It looks good. And it gives you a good idea of what you could do with Lightwave. By adding more frames, for example, going to 360 frames instead of 180, we would have got even smoother motion. By upping the resolution, adding shadowing and reflection, we could have got an even more photorealistic animation. But this will give us a good idea of what we can do. So there you have it, the basics of animating on the Amiga. Now it's off to Computers R Us to buy software. But how do you decide which one to buy? Well, when you've figured out how much time and money you want to invest, you can move on to the important question. Is it love? Imagine that you had created the animations you saw today. Which one made you gasp? Which program looked like fun? Without a doubt, if one of them inspired you, if the program made you want to dig in and get started, then it's the right one. As in any romance, you need to find a mate that can understand the way you think. For instance, if you draw and sketch, try Disney's Animation Studio. If you think in color and want pixel-by-pixel -pixel control, try D-Paint. If you talk in angles and parameters but can't draw to save your life, Imagine will probably feel right to you. There are a lot of animation packages out there. Visit your software dealer and try a few of them out. Chances are, if you find an animation that you love and a program makes sense, then you've found a match. With an Amiga and some passion, there's very little you can't accomplish.